too much. Um, I don't normally ask my mother to. <laughs> just, I, I am way overdue on getting clean version of this. Thank you so much. Um, so what I'm going to do is walk you through some ways to think about systematically increasing your odds of success in fundraising and reducing the pain. Uh, a little bit of personal background. So I'm managing partner at Hoff Capital. We're an early stage VC based here in New York. We are backed by 50 limited partners from 16 countries. Uh, we uh, invest at the seed and A level, but our most recent check, uh, we co-led a $100 million round with a $25 million check. So we're able to do that as well on an opportunistic basis. We particularly like companies where we can generate revenues for them from the LP network. Our LPs include some large conglomerates, some large uh, business families based abroad, um, and they're quite diverse. Um, but among areas of interest include in FinTech, which is my background and my focus, uh, real estate tech is an area of interest. But we will look at anything. We have a thesis that the areas of innovation are unpredictable inherently, and when it claims they can predict it, it is not, uh, uh, at best, can do that only on a, on a percentage estimation basis, not with confidence. Uh, and so we try and keep a very broad portal to a wide range of, of companies, and then we filter through of several thousand companies per year in order to invest in approximately 10. So that tells you what the, the odds of success are. Uh, I'm also founder of Harvard Business School of the Angels of New York. We are the largest angel group on the East Coast. Our members are all Harvard affiliates. The name is sort of like John Harvard statue, the statue of several lies. Mm -hmm. So our name is on multiple levels misleading. We are open to all Harvard affiliates, uh, not just Harvard Business School, and we invest blind to school affiliation. If anything, there's a bias against the Harvard grads because of the ego problem, which none of you know anything about. <laughs> uh, so we have sister chapters in NorCal, SoCal, Sao Paulo, Beijing, uh, San Francisco, uh, London and Paris are very strong in a number of other major cities globally where the Harvard people like to congregate. So I'm happy in the Q&A to talk more about being this group. Um, I invest only through Hot Capital, through uh, my firm. I'm also coming off cold, so I'm not contagious to my knowledge, but if I cough, that's why. Uh, don't be afraid. I brought tissues. So there's no need to pay attention. Text your mom. Tell her you love her. They love that, I tell you. Um, but you can download the slides for this at that link, tech.com slash rc. So no need to photograph or take detailed notes. So first let me talk about <coughs> traditional methods of fundraising. So it's really painful, right? You will get rejected the overwhelming majority of the time. So let me draw an analogy to the way that a butterfly turns into, uh, emerges from what it used to be, which is a caterpillar. So when caterpillars morph into a chrysalis and then break out, uh, they, they have a lengthy process of merging from the, the chrysalis, um, and they have to basically fight their way out. And so some scientists tried an experiment. They took a razor and they slit it to see what happens if you make it easier. So what happened was the nascent butterfly emerges faster, but it can't fly. Because the process of fighting your way out strengthens its arms such that it can actually fly. So as much as fundraising is inherently painful, and it's painful, been painful for me in my past lives as a CEO, I would urge you to take it as an opportunity for feedback um, because as much as it's annoying, there actually is a lot of value, I think, in listening to the feedback from the investors to the extent you get it. And I will go to why that is so important here. So I published some research a few years ago in the journal Private Equity, published by your employer, um, on the best practices of VCs and private equity funds in origination. How do we source deals? This is the reverse problem for the problem you as founders have, right? which is how do you get money. We as investors, Seth and I, have the problem of how do we find interesting entrepreneurs and we can back them. So the median VC and private equity fund looks at 87 companies before investing in one. A typical founder looks at a handful of ideas, right? So uh, let's just test that. Barat, how many ideas did you consider before you started this company? A couple. A couple, a couple yeah. right. So you have a non-diversified portfolio, right? You've got one startup, your career, your name, your rep are all on it. We have a diversified portfolio. So who should be more selective? I should. Exactly. But that's not practically what happens. <laughs> so the fundamental problem here is that everyone thinks that their baby is cute, adorable, and everyone else thinks they're red and wriggly and screaming, right? So you're a biased judge. So I would urge you to have a very high bar for the business that you chose to devote your energies to before you quit that awesome job at Facebook, um, because there is a high failure rate in this business. And VCs, by the nature of our business, are exposed to a lot of failure, and we try our best to mitigate that by being very selective. Feel free to raise your hand if you have comments to add or questions. So let me show you the most amazing mm. statistic I've ever seen in the world of finance. Mm. This is a statistic from a study of public equity investors, investors in mutual funds. 
What it found is if you invest in a company run by someone you went to school with, meaning at the same time, not your good friends, just the same time, same era, uh, you get on average 840 basis points higher returns. So this is totally ludicrous, right? If I could consistently generate 840 basis points returns, I would be John Paulson and not David, right? <laughs> so John Paulson may be a bad comp. I'll settle for uh, you know someone else. Um, at least for the past few years of mediocre returns. So this statistic is not an Ivy League effect. It holds regardless of which school you went to. What matters is that if you went to school at the same time, same era as a CEO, you have more color, more insight in what's going on with CEO. Did they come to reunion with the third wife talking about the yacht? Or they say, hey, I'm hustling, working, I'm focusing on my business. Right? You want to know this sort of information. So uh, if that is true in the public markets, all the more so is it true in the private markets, where there's far less information, far less regulation. So the, the network-based information is critical for how VCs make decisions. And that's why this industry is so network driven. The networks are penetrable, and obviously going to Harvard gives you a huge advantage, but it is very, very network driven. And so I'm going to talk a lot about how do you go on your network to identify the people who are likely to give you capital. Yes, and could you introduce yourself, please? I'm Jenny. I uh, run, co run Freewell. Um, and what is Freewell? Uh, it literally makes free wills. And yeah, free we, we're wills. enterprise SaaS <laughs> to nonprofits, okay. plant based fundraising. Um, so I, I have to be a little bit annoying or prying because you said it was your favorite paper, so I'm very curious. Like, it, it, couldn't that whole effect be explained by the fact that people who are very well connected, like central nodes, are just going to get like better returns? No, no. The researchers are competent people, uh, and they adjusted for all the other effects you might think of. Uh, one of the things that drives these returns, by the way, is not just do you buy the stock, but do you sell, right? So you go to reunion and you see that they're talking about, you know how their, their awesome new estate and their fifth home, and you think, okay, this person's not focused on the business. So it's not just who's more central. Remember, it applies regardless of what school you went to, and regardless of what era you went to school with CEO. How many data points could you possibly have? A lot, right? Because who, who do you think, it, in today's world, it's very easy to identify where people went to school and yeah. what era mm -hmm. for both the CEOs and for the investors. So you can get this data for the overwhelming majority of fund managers and for CEOs. And then you just do a correlation. Obviously, it's c more complex than that, but yeah. that's fundamentally the analytical technique. Cool. So the traditional way people raise capital uh, reminds me of the way people used to date in the world. Well, this probably predates many of you, right? Is you randomly go to college and hope you meet someone. You go to parties and hope you meet someone. And it's very efficient, right? So how do people date today? 90% of single Americans use online dating sites. Over 1 million Americans, including me, have met their spouse online. Any technology that can find me a wife is a killer app. So, so why is that? Because you can more efficiently zoom in on the person who's the desired gender, height, values, right? whatever your search parameters are. So same point applies online. You can more efficiently zoom in on the people who are more likely to give you money and not randomly go to conferences hoping to meet an investor, which is a suboptimal use of your time. So for one thing we're not going to talk about today in depth is what you actually say to the investors. If we have time, we will. But but that's not the focus of the presentation. Um, but I have a pitch checklist on my website of what to put in your pitch deck. I will highlight, don't try and hide information. This drives me absolutely batty when people send a deck and it's missing cap table, it's missing uh, the history of the financing, it's missing a pivot you made, because any competent investor will ask you about that stuff. It's just a red flag. Uh, I got pitched today by an, by an entrepreneur and she lost the chance to get capital from us because in the first three minutes she ducked two questions. It's like, yeah. Right? I don't want to work with this person. Another online <coughs> tool I suggest you look at is pitchbot.vc. So this is an attempt to use AI to help you optimize your pitch and understand in advance what questions people are likely to ask you. There's a set of standard, well-established questions. Our industry is very, very transparent. So it's annoying to VCs and does not reflect well in your preparedness if you don't have canned answers ready for the most common questions. What's really impressive, but almost no one does it, is when in your deck you say, here are the top three objections we're hearing, and then here's our response. Another slide that is rare but recommended is, here are the people who tried to do what we're doing, who failed, here's why they failed. I did informational interviews with management from those other companies, and here's what we're doing that's different. right? Because smart VCs will ask you those questions, so try and get ahead of the curve. So in general, I'm a big advocate of social media. 
for this purpose because it turns cold calls into warm calls. This is a picture of very cold calls. <laughs> so you can more efficiently get to the right person. <coughs> Excuse me. A um, couple tools I'll highlight. I'm an investor in a company called Founder Suite, uh, which helps to track uh, your, your outreach process. Also has a whole set of legal resources to help you. I also would point you to the company Brief, which is a tool sp uh, sponsored by NFX in California, which helps identify the VCs who are most likely to invest in your particular firm based on industry, geography, stage, diversity for the VCs who care for that, and other filters that may apply to your situation. Any questions so far? Uh, yes. I have a question. Uh, why did you say that when someone was pitching you, um, what was the problem that, that made them lose the business in three minutes? Or so lose the opportunity? This just happened this afternoon. This <laughs> Make is, sure I won't do it. <laughs> yeah, this is a relatively well-known individual. Uh, so I asked her AUM of her fund, and she ducked the question, just told me how much she treated, uh, which is not at all the same thing. And I asked her IRR, and she said, I don't know. And that's a very bad answer if you have a background in hedge funds. Uh, and uh, I asked her another question about who was working on the company, and she didn't give me a straight answer. Right? You want people to give you a straight answer. Right? And this is sort of like dating. The pe what people are like when you're dating is what they're like when you're married. It's usually a little worse because they're not on their best <laughs> behavior. So this is just a bad sign the first three minutes. She wasn't being straight with me. Other questions? Can I get you some water? Okay. So I'm sure we have a lot of mathematically oriented people, so I have one formula here. This is a formula to articulate the value of your social network, and specifically for today's purposes, your capital network. Who's going to give you money? I'm going to go through each of these seven variables and talk about how to use technology to increase the value of that variable and increase your rapidity with which you win capital. So I'll define it as we go along, not now. But the key thing to highlight here is it's all multiple consent, right? So the more of everything, the better. But you only have so much time, so there's a trade-off between them. Most obviously, is a trade-off between strength and number. So I think of it as McKinsey versus McDonald's. So these two firms have very different marketing strategies. McDonald's is on TV, and the reason is because they make tiny bits of money from millions of Americans, and McKinsey makes 500K checks from a tiny number of Americans. So they, they brand differently, and they optimize their network differently. For your purposes, you're more like McKinsey, right? So it's a bad sign for me when people are all over Twitter for an hour per day, including public CEOs who do that, because you're not gonna get investors in there. I mean, yes, randomly you might, but it's unlikely. The more efficient way to use your time is by connecting with the Harvard community or other communities you're a member of, where you're gonna build a more trusted relationship and where you're hoping to get that six-figure, seven-figure check from people in the community. Um, all the investors are looking at your social profile, they're looking at your everything they can find about you, and we want to make sure that you're spending your time in what seems to us a reasonable manner. Questions? Okay. So first component of your network is character, right? You want to raise capital from people who are of character. We have an in-house blacklist of VCs and angels who we have had bad experiences with, and we gently, or less gently, guide companies away from raising capital from them. Um, because we just don't think that they're good actors. So super important to reference check. It is harder to get out of an investor relationship than out of a marriage. So I would urge you to do two-way due diligence with your LPs, particularly, obviously, as with regard to character. Right? There will be stresses in the relationship over time. You read in the press about the company, you know, Facebook's right, where every round is up and to the right. That is only what happens for a tiny majority of companies. In the real world, People get fired, right? There are down rounds, all sorts of unpleasantness, and it's important to get ready for that. I will point, I list here a couple of other services, some of which are free, which help you surface information about people. Uh, another tool I like is ZoomInfo. So ZoomInfo synthetically creates a bio of people in your network based on public data. So it'll take an SEC filing, your uh, Harvard Crimson article that you wrote where you talk about your challenges coming from, you know, some some small country to Harvard, and they mash it all up into one bio, and that allows you to search for people who resonate with your model, because you're from the same small country, because you have a background in the same industry, because you went to the same school, right? Depending on the nature of your business, that all increases your likelihood of close if the person has some a priori connection with your firm. So in Free Will's case, maybe a VC who has a law degree, right, who will understand what wheels are and won't be scared of it, that's a very simple example of how you filter for people who 
people resonate with your model. So another filter is confidence, right? You want people who are actually going to add value. So an anecdote, uh, Daniel Zamino is a well-known French angel, founder of BCG Paris, graduate of a well-known business school on the West Coast, and he's a member of a mailing list for graduates of said business school. So he sent out an email a number of years ago saying, I'm an investor in this company and I'm looking to raise around. Is anyone, would anyone like to learn more? So counsel will tell you not to do this, but he did it and it's okay that he survived. Uh, so he got pinged by another grad and they ended up raising eight mil. So what I think is interesting about this anecdote is lots of people went to top schools. Not everyone is systematic about leveraging it. So I'd encourage you to join the relevant Facebook, LinkedIn, et cetera, groups for your Harvard class, for your grad school class, if you went to grad school, for maybe your major, if there exists such a group, and if there isn't, maybe you should create one. Uh, and as appropriate, depending on the culture of that community, say, oh, I'm launching a company, would welcome advice. And that will help to surface to this community with whom you have a priori affinity, the people who will resonate with your model and can be helpful to you. Right? The process of entrepreneurship is like the children's story of stone soup. So this is a story I've told my kids, right? A soldier comes to town, he has no food, and he says, I'm gonna make soup from a stone. And the villagers say, that's crazy, how can you do that? He says, watch. So sets up a kettle, fills it with water, puts some magic stone in, puts a spoon in, says, you know, needs a little salt. So they bring him some salt. Put the spoon in, needs a little pepper, right? A little more vigor than it, he does pepper. Needs a little more body. That's a potato in. By the time he's done, he's got soup from the stone, right? So entrepreneurship is all about taking advantage of resources you do not control and bringing them into your firm and leveraging them and then creating a real organization, right? Very different from working at a big company where you snap your fingers and you get the resources you need. I realize they're corporate politics, but nonetheless, you at least have, in theory, more resources than the people in the startup world. So another filter is relevance. So I'm an investor in Interaxon. This is a Toronto company that makes a brain sensing headset. And they ran a crowdfunding campaign on Indiegogo, which I'm also an investor in, uh, to, to raise capital for a product they had not yet built, which is a headset that would give you feedback to help you meditate better. And they got 300K cash, via credit card, of advance orders for a product that didn't exist. So this is an awesome way to finance your company because if you fail to ship the product, they have no recourse. These are people who care so much, who are so excited about your product, they're willing to give you capital for a product that doesn't yet exist, so they're taking the same risk that a VC does. So when we invested, we knew that this had happened, and this was tremendous validation, that people were so excited about this product, they'd give them capital up front. So I'd encourage you to f see if there are ways to crowdfund aspects of your business, both for the cash, but also for the validation. It's good when people submit their email and say, yes, I'm interested. It's better when they give you their credit card right, and give you their money. So <coughs> another way of identifying the right people is some of the corporate analysis software companies. I've listed some here, uh, which help you identify the org chart of different firms. So in your case, you might want to target the uh, people at Skadden who deal with, with wills, right? I'm assuming they have such a group, right? It's not always obvious who deals with that. Or actually a better example is uh, someone at an elder care organization, right, who thinks about legal matters of the residents of a senior citizen home, right? There probably is such a person, but it's not going to stay on the website. They're not a searchable scan. So these tools help you identify who within an elder care organization might deal with wills and can help free will start a conversation about maybe rolling out this product to all of the residents of the home who are closer to death than hopefully most of us. That wasn't too morbid, was it? Okay. So next factor is strength. So no surprise, you're more likely to get capital from people with whom you have a higher strength relationship. Caroline Haythorn-Thwaite is an academic who's done research on this and found that the more media you use to touch someone, the higher the perceived strength. Love to know if people at Facebook are working on this. So you meet someone, you shake hands, right? That's one medium of interaction. You follow up with an email. You follow up with a text, and a Skype, and a WhatsApp, and they say, you're stalking me, stop. <laughs> so it's not, obviously, situational, you have to consider what's appropriate, but if you're in China, right, your Skype is not the default, right, it's WeChat. And you're showing your cultural knowledge, just like if you speak Chinese in China, right, that shows that you have a sense of the culture. If you WeChat with people, you're showing you understand the culture. 
So this gives people different levels of familiarity with, with you and how you think, right? You see, are they fast on texting? Do they use emojis in the way you're used to? Are you a dork who doesn't use emojis, right? That's what my kids would probably say about me. <laughs> but that's for a whole host of reasons. So I would encourage you to identify the media channels that are appropriate, just like all of us automatically code switch to the language that is appropriate, if you're multilingual, for the person with whom we're talking. Uh, I also encourage you to, in your SIG file, put the, the identifiers, right? So if you're corresponding in a Skype world, where a lot of people use Skype, put the Skype ID there to show my door is open. I can communicate via Skype. Questions? So <coughs> the more transparency you give people, the better for increasing perceived trust. At a later stage, when you're raising your Series B, it's close to the default that people use some sort of virtual data room. At the seed level, most people don't. But one easy way of communicating a greater level of professionalism is to use a data room. That helps to increase the FOMO, the fear of missing out of investors, by saying, I'm running a real process here, I'm protecting my corporate data, not by being obnoxious, like asking for an NDA, which is a DDL killer for the vast majority of VCs, but by having a data room like what we're used to when we look at later stage deals. And I've listed a few vendors here. So next component of your network is information. You can't access people in your network unless you have data about them. When I interview people for outward facing jobs, like a salesperson, junior VC, fundraiser, one of my standard interview questions is, what is your CRM and how do you populate it? The wrong answer is my phone, right? Another wrong answer is Excel or Shoebox. The correct answer is I use a real CRM and every single business card I get, I scan and I put in there, right? Because if I'm hiring you to go raise money for a firm, I want someone who will go meet people and get their card and will follow up and solicit them to give us money, right? That's your job. And you're not gonna be confident at your job unless you are gathering data about these people and are in a position to follow up. So I've listed here some data vendors that can enrich your database and make it easier for you to follow up as appropriate with the people you're corresponding with in order for you to cook your own stone soup. I've also listed here a number of databases of venture capital and private equity funds to help you identify the ones that are most likely to invest in your base, again, on stage, geography, sector, and so on. <coughs> Another obvious filter is tracking the VCs who are investing in your space, so in legal tech space in Jenny's case. I will highlight this is often a lagging indicator because most VCs don't want to invest in too many companies in the same space. Uh, of course, you have to be sensitive to how that's defined, right? So most VCs, including us, won't invest in direct competitors. Most VCs, including us, will invest in the same sector, right? So we've obviously invested in multiple fintech companies. But there's a balance here. So if you see that someone has invested in a company very similar to yours, it's a waste of time to approach the people who invested in that round. If you can get color and who else looked at the deal, that's super helpful, right? Because those people are interested in the space, uh, but they're not conflicted. And uh, that will, will also increase your odds of finding investors excited about you. I will also highlight that by the time a company has raised 100 mil and is getting big stories in TechCrunch, you're probably late to the party, right? At least from the point of view of an early stage company. We, of course, assess competitors. What we ideally like to see is two, three competitors. If, there are, if you're a um, you know, robo-invest for millennials, right? So there are approximately 200 of them. You are very late to the party. Uh, and we're not going to invest. Um, so if you pitched RoboInvest for Millennials eight years ago, right, we might have invested because at that point there are very few people in it. And what we see is being a founder is the new, C, the new analyst. Everyone wants to be a founder. And so when a sector and idea is hot, a lot of people chase it and they say, I'm the RoboInvest for Millennials, but millennial women, right? And they're just so different than men, and so it justifies a totally separate business. You, know, you could argue that it justifies a different business, but there's a limit on the number of them. Yes? But when you're looking at the craft space, um, what, how much do you weight differentiation within that space if you think it's a certain angle of it is underserved versus just that space being craft in general? Or right. is that something you consider? Yeah, absolutely. So the first thing we're looking for is if there are several companies with very similar models, which definitely happens, uh, we think we're taking a bet on who is the team who's going to win. So we invested in a company called Starship Technologies, which makes uh, ground drones. These are rolling robots that go around your city and will deliver your pizza to you. So when we invested, there are a couple of other firms pursuing this, including one backed by a major California VC. And we looked at them, we looked at the team, we looked at the amount of capital they raised, and we said, 
we're investing in the winner. If this is just a superior team. The founders previously co-founded Skype, which is a good credential. Uh, and since we invested, the other competitors have, with one exception, shut down. Right? So we're very comfortable with that decision. So another filter we're looking for, to your point, is differentiation. Right? So they're usually not perfect clones. Usually there's some differences in strategy, and we'll have a conversation with them about why they chose the variance that they chose to agree with that particular logic and uh, proceed from there. If we're really passionate about a certain thesis, we'll talk with all the major players. We'll be transparent. We'll say, we're talking with your competitors, right, just so you know. Um, but we want to know the space and take it from there and try and pick the winner. Um, that is a strategy more often used by the later stage VCs who have the resources to do that at scale. But early stage VCs will do it as well. Other questions? So another tool I'll point you to is Signal. Uh, this uh, overlaps with the company I mentioned, the, the service I mentioned earlier, the company brief, in identifying the most relevant VCs. What you see here in small type is lots of different categories, e-commerce, distributed workforce, VC, diverse VCs, female VCs, VCs who invest in diverse founders, 39 of them. Hmm. So the data is imperfect, uh, but it will help to identify the VCs who might resonate with your model. <coughs> Um, I urge you to spend real money on a lawyer. Uh, it is very painful for us to see people who have poor docs because it invariably costs more to undo the damage and re-engineer them. Uh, if your lawyer is your sister-in-law's you know, estate lawyer who's doing your startup docs, this is an extremely bad sign. You want someone who specializes in this ecosystem, knows the industry norms, we use the standard structures. It, you might disagree with the norms, maybe try and negotiate them, but there's a reason why the industry has certain norms, and unless there's a strong reason, I would encourage you to follow those norms. There are places to be creative, and there are places not to be creative. Uh, so I've listed here a couple of tools that will be helpful to you when you get to the stage of negotiating with your investors. Venture Dealer is a good one for visually understanding the implications of playing with the options pool, playing with the post money and pre money and other variables. Uh, that's not what I'm going to focus on today, um, but, uh, but it's certainly something you should think about later on. A very common error we see people making is they raise a couple million dollars in notes, which is a very nice word for debt, and then they try and raise around. So let's just do the math, right? So you have five million in notes, and you're trying to raise a round of six million. You think, awesome. What that means is that means someone has to lead the round with a million dollars, right? Because the five million of prior notes are converting in. Right. Again, there are wrinkles here, but the point is, this is an overhang that can make it harder for you to, to raise a subsequent round when you have an excessive amount of debt. We generally have a bias to, to doing a priced round, an equity round, as opposed to a convertible note for a whole host of reasons, not least of which is debt, both in your personal credit card life and on company level, is awesome until you have to pay it, at which point it can be painful. Yes? Can you say more about areas to be creative and areas not to be creative? Like specifically. Uh, can you give an example of where you want to be creative? Oh, I I didn't think of anything coming into it. It just seemed like you had some clear ideas. Yeah. So an example is people coming with non-traditional preferences uh, in terms of that portion of the the term sheet and say I want this for such and such reasons, mm -hmm. uh, or they say I want really fast vesting, two-year vesting for the founders, which mm -hmm. would definitely be a problem for us because you want the founders to be around for a while. It's a red flag if the founder says, I want to be fully vested in two years. Now, maybe the founder worked on the company for two years prior, mm -hmm. but we still want them around for a number of years subsequently. So there's a negotiation process, but it's, it just shows that you're not aware of the industry norms. It's like going into a Harvard Club party and wearing a bathing suit, which maybe once a year is appropriate, but most of the time it's not, <laughs> right? There's certain norms for every society, and those are the norms in our society as for your vesting, the one your cliff is the most common structure. Again, with wrinkles about whether the vesting started earlier when you founded the company or later. Uh, and so we look for people to be within those norms. Can you give examples of creativity done well? Oh, well, we're all for creativity in business model, in industry, in, in uh, how you staffed it, if you find creative ways to source talent. I know a company whose whole tech team were Turkish immigrants. Uh, to the extent that a lot of the internal communications was Turkish, which is not great if you don't speak Turkish. Um, but by advertising in the Turkish language newspapers, no one else is doing that, right? So that was access to technical talent that most people didn't have access to. And you get the Turks who don't speak great English and may not get a job because their English is mediocre, but they get a job at this company because it's a more Turkish-heavy environment, 
right? And they, this particular company lucked into it because I hired first engineer was a Turk and he got his friends in, but that actually worked out well for them. So you didn't mean in fundraising be creative. You're like in fundraising, don't be creative and no, everything I, else be creative? I, I don't want to overgeneralize this. I, I, my point is just be sensitive to what are the norms, right? The CEO I spoke with this afternoon probably thought she was being clever and ducking my question. I think she came off as deceitful and we're not gonna invest in her. So I've listed here the Facebooks, to use a cliche, of different verticals, right? The Facebook of angel groups, the Facebook of angel communities. So this is a great way to identify uh, potential investors for you. Uh, the ones in the far right are less relevant for you uh, at this stage of your business, but the early stage ones on the left are more relevant. In general, the biggest problem in fundraising is finding a lead, right? It, one, another error people make is they come in and say, Correlation Ventures said they're gonna invest. That's not Correlation Ventures' model, which is a well-known, well-respected fund which co-invests with other funds. Correlation Ventures' model is if a top-tier, reputable lead investor comes in, then they're very likely to join the round. That's not the same thing. It's sort of like saying, I'll marry you once you win the Olympic cold, right? Mm -hmm. Not the same thing as I will marry you. So, uh, so I would, uh, fi I find these sources generally helpful for syndicating. There are some like our crowd, which will lead, right? So you can think of them like any other VC in terms any other VC that leads. In general, don't spend a lot of your time on VCs that don't lead until you have a lead investor. And then it's relatively easy to go to a bunch of VCs and say, hey, I have a lead, I have two mil of allocation, do you wanna fill it out, right? That's the downhill slope. But another common error people make is they go network with a bunch of angels who say, I like you, but I'm waiting for a lead. And then where are you left, right? So focus your energy first on the hardest task and then go downhill. Yes, Bora. Uh, as a primary investor, as a, as a fund which leads, uh, how do you guys view other funds which don't lead when they come into your rounds? Mm -hmm. so are so they we, encouraged or do you guys not encourage that? Uh, so a couple things. One is we, as a firm, we do lead, but we also syndicate. Mm -hmm. uh, most of our investments are co-investments with others. So I just want to clarify that sure. point. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, it is certainly a very positive sign and it makes it much easier if you come in and say Sequoia is leading, right? Because that indicates validation, they've done their due diligence, they've priced it, it just speeds up our process and the process of most other VCs. Our industry is very, very reputation sensitive. So if you say Sequoia is leading, I would guess the great majority of other VCs will say, awesome, this will boost my crunch base score and we'll co-invest <laughs> with you, regardless of the underlying merits of the company. Um, so so the, our, the industry, it is normative for people to syndicate. So we don't, we want to co-invest with other VCs uh, because we want multiple parents around the baby. Because inevitably when the company has challenges, we want more people who care about the baby, will support the baby. Uh, there's also vagaries in when people have capital, right? So maybe one fund around the table has invested their fund fully and is now raising their fund three, but doesn't have dry powder. They can't support you no matter how much they love you. So that's why you want multiple fans around you to fund you at that next round. So we're, we track who are the value-added relevant VCs for the different companies in which we're engaged. So I've also listed here a number of data vendors who track the universe of private companies. You are all being tracked by the likes of CB Insights and Crunchbase. They are tracking on LinkedIn that you said, I am CEO of a startup, right? They're tracking the industry description you put. They're tracking on your website, right? The one paragraph summary of what you do that you put there, and they're sucking in that data. And you're being judged based on this data. So I would urge you to log in and edit your profile. It's kind of a pain, but let's acknowledge the reality that we all have data exhaust. We're all being judged on it, and you want the data exhaust to accurately reflect you. Uh, some of these are more relevant for you than others. You can judge it mainly by market share, right? So CB Insights is definitely influential. Crunchbase is very influential. Uh, LinkedIn is certainly influential. One of our standard tests is we look at your LinkedIn profile. If it says you're still employed or it says consultant, that's a bad sign, right? What we want to see is CEO and co-founder, you know, your focus on this and all your other jobs on your LinkedIn, there's an end date, right? <laughs> now there are exceptions, right? We understand maybe you're consulting, like get it off the ground and you're just at the baby stages. That's totally fine. We get that. But it makes it easier when you've severed your ties, you break the bridges and you're hustling ahead, building this great company. So I also highlight for you a number of online communities uh, where your targets exist. 
So if you go back 15 years ago, people used to talk about cyberspace. Remember their books published with that in the title? And the concept in that era was that cyberspace was different than meat space, right? But now no one talks about cyberspace because what all of us realize is that your friends whom you interact with and have coffee with are your same friends whom you friend on Facebook, whom you, you Skype with, whom you DM with, right? They're the same people. They're just different modalities for communicating with those folks. So the social behaviors online are mirroring the social behaviors offline and vice versa. An example of that. So you're trying to target, to use Reed Hoffman's terms, term, the haves, right? The people who have money, who can invest in you, the senior executives who make partnership decisions for free will, who can make your company because they roll it out to all the senior citizen res residences nationally. And those people erect walls around themselves because they're being deluged all the time by the job seekers and the capital seekers and so on. LinkedIn, one of the reasons for their success is they designed LinkedIn specifically to be attractive to the haves and allow them to maintain control over who links them, who approaches them. So one of the ways to get to the haves is figure out where they reside. They reside in gated communities, just like in a physical life, in meat space. They also live in gated communities in the Hamptons and like places. So what I mean by that is if you go on LinkedIn, you will find the Harvard class of 2000 group. You will find the CEO of Series B New York Startups group. You'll find all sorts of groups which are gated, and I'd urge you to find the club that will just barely have you as a member <laughs> and get into it and figure out ways to engage with the people in that club. Uh, you don't want to do it in a spammy way, hey, I'm raising money, right? Because that makes you look desperate, but there are softer ways to do it, like mailing a specific individual, like sending out a note saying, I'm recruiting for my new company, here's what we do, I'm looking for advisors. Because you have higher credibility, higher response rate from these sort of gated communities. Another version of this are some of the, the independent online groups. For example, I'm a past member of a group called the International Executives Research Group, which is for senior executives with international background. You have to be interviewed to get into this group. There is an annual fee. And it started as a job hunters group, but it evolved into a general resource group. And I, in a prior life, I got a lot of value from it from interacting with people with similar life experiences from whom I could learn. Uh, CIRMO is a group focused on doctors. You probably are aware of it, right? So I would look for all these groups. The most powerful groups are not publicized, right? It's only for the CEOs of the big companies in the space. And it might be as informal as they get together and play poker, right? I understand the CEOs of big aviation companies have a club like this where they get together, right? And you have to run a you know, multi-billion dollar firm to be into it. So <laughs> hopefully you'll get there. Okay. So last component of your social network is diversity. So this sounds very, very politically correct, but I'm including it not for that reason, but because it's backed up by the academic research. <coughs> if you look at who gets promoted within an organization, let's say you grew up through the engineering function, you know all the engineers, they think you're great, right? you're well regarded, you could get promoted to CTO, awesome. right? You're probably not gonna get promoted to CEO because the CEO bridges functions. You have to have good relationships with marketing and sales and HR and all the other functions to understand what's going on, speak their language, be respected, gain buy-in. Similarly, in fundraising, if you're networking with the people just like you, right, the other Harvard grads from class of 2012, that's fine, that's a very credible group. <laughs> Did I hit some of you on the nail there? Um, so, but the problem there is that your marginal value to those folks from a social network analysis point of view is low because they have the same network as you, right? An example of that, in Lee Will's case, is if you talk with investors in Canada, right, who say, oh, this is interesting, she'll give me access to the US ecosystem, she will teach me about the US and maybe I can roll it out to Canada, they, your marginal value to them from a network point of view is greater than yet another Harvard grad sitting in New York. Uh, that's a simple example, but I'm sure you can think about it for your particular situation. So I've listed here some startup competitions, another source of capital to consider. Of course, Harvard has its own, uh, which I'm involved with, which I hope you will all apply for. And <laughs> I urge you to think generally about who is one step away from you. Uh, in That might be by industry, right? Uh, it might be by their job title, right? So in Shahar's case, he's targeting importers and exporters. So let's think about who deals with shipping out large containers, right? Who are executives at such companies? Those are interesting angels from influencers. Not necessarily the people who deal with import-export, but the people who have influence over their apparel company where they have to ship lots of stuff from Bangladesh. 
So a couple of last steps about moving this process forward. So Clerkey is a YC company that you might want to use to lower your legal costs. Uh, and that's uh, used by, I think, the majority of YC companies. Carta is a company we use at our firm and we encourage our companies to use to track a cap table. This is a very, very common area where people make mistakes, which can be quite expensive reputationally and financially. So I'd encourage you to do that. Uh, and I've listed here a couple of links that I'd point you to. The Long-Term Stock Exchange, uh, started by Eric Reese of Lean Startup fame, mm -hmm. has developed a number of tools to help startup founders, which I would encourage you to look at, uh, which you might find helpful. Um, I also want to cold call Seth. So Seth, as a VC, has dealt with this issue a lot. Seth, do you have things you'd like to add or advice for our room? Uh, let's see. I, I want to kind of go back to the issue yeah. of creativity. Um, I think that we came across some firms that are you know, interesting ways of sort of generating excitement. And I think that's where we certainly try to differentiate not in the traditional way of just, like you said, getting email subscriptions or having some sort of polls that they've generated, but like finding ways, I think, to go outside of the box. I think that was very helpful because we want to be able to see what the brand potential is as well as sort of like the, um, the early adoption. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was something interesting. Um, I thought one of the questions actually I was curious about um, was when you get um, uh, founders or um, startup employees who are, um, say, dodging questions, but maybe perhaps they didn't understand. I'm sure the question was straightforward, but I'm, I'm always trying probe versus and give people the benefit of the doubt versus trying to um, rule them out. I don't know how you sort of, which side of the coin you typically fall on. So I certainly try and give people the benefit of the doubt, but yeah, within, within reason. Um, so, and uh, I also are monitoring for how com familiar they are with our ecosystem. Mm -hmm. If someone has previously founded a company, but the deck is disorganized, I'm going to dock them more in my mental grading system than a first-time founder, right? Because they don't know the norms of our world as well as the person who's been through this process before. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and then one thing I would say with respect to sort of like networking in general, I have found that a lot of people tend to think of like the first easiest way to kind of get in front of an investor or a connection and that might be um, a cold email or maybe potentially like a, a third degree connection but I urge people to always think about like the best way to do it as opposed to the easiest way right you might re you might come up with more creative ways like down the road but I would always urge people to kind of say okay here are the three ways we could possibly go at this person that we want to target let's think of the best way because we might only have one shot you don't want to keep bothering someone and seeming like you're harassing them or stalking them so there are two best ways to approach someone one way is you get referred in by an LP a limited partner or one of their CEOs in which case they have a lot of pressure to meet with you but an even better way to approach someone is do your research and say oh I see you publish research on technology for investing in private companies uh, great paper really insightful uh, and my company specifically deals with this problem. Um, I notice you invested in Founder Suite, and that's relevant. Uh, I'd love to meet you. So that shows that you've done your research. It's not a spam. 99.9% .9 of the pitches I get are very clearly cut and paste. They've done no research. And that's a, a knock against you, right? This is not a quantity game. It's a quality game. All you need is a few investors to believe in you. And so I'd urge you to approach fewer people and do it thoughtfully because then you're more likely to get a response. Other questions? Yes? You kind of walk through like a very broad universe of tools. Mm -hmm. How do you think about like deploying them in like how sequentially you use them, the frequency by which you use them? Like if you're someone who is very much so starting their company versus someone who has already raised some money, like how do you think about kind of like the trade off, <coughs> the prioritization of these? So the question is a little too general for me to feel comfortable answering. Do you have a specific tension that you're thinking about? I guess my question is, as you think about kind of like raising money from individual VCs, I know you mentioned there's like a lot of different tools that you could potentially use. How do you kind of bring them together and develop almost kind of like a CRM of VCs? And like how frequently do you think about reaching out to them? How frequently do you think about kind of refreshing that database of who might be like the right person for you, that type of thing. Almost like lead scoring, I guess. Yeah, so a couple points. Uh, Mark's sister wrote an influential blog post. It's called VCs Invest in Lines, Not Dots. <coughs> I mean, it's good to approach a VC early and build a narrative. I actually disagree. And the reason is VCs are busy 
And I personally don't want to meet with people until they're at a point where they're raising capital. Your mileage may vary. He's entitled to his philosophy. I'm entitled to mine. Um, but I, my view is that you're running this risk when you approach people early that they're not dumb. They realize that you're preparing for fundraise. They're greeting you. Inevitably, you're less baked. You're less attractive than six months from later. So it's fine to approach them and say, I'm thinking about a startup idea. Um, but and, and sort of I'm looking for advice on these five ideas because then I get it. You're not going to be graded because you haven't even done anything. You're just researching. Yeah. And that's smart, right? Because that shows that unlike most founders, right, you're trying to evaluate a lot of ideas before you pursue one, right? But as soon as you say, I'm working on Startup X, the minute you meet with a VC, you're being evaluated for that particular startup idea. And it's totally fine if it's early and you'll get an early stage evaluation. People adjust for that. But if you wait, you get a higher grade, right? Mm -hmm. You're more attractive. And inevitably, your pitch changes, your language changes, yeah. the team changes. So I would urge you to focus on refining the company and then pitch and then meeting the VCs. Because if you do it too early, you're using up your opportunities to meet with VCs and you're going to have a low close rate. Cool. Yes, Jenny. I feel like I've asked a lot of questions of someone else. Go ahead. Um, <laughs> I've received conflicting advice around the following situation, which is there is a very reputable Series A fund that's sending uh, a super smart <coughs> associate to talk to you like every three months, um, whether or not to take those conversations or not. Um, so first off, it's flattering, right? It does indicate some interest. Uh, the associate's job is to screen for the partners. So in a lot of firms, they are, they're rarely decision makers. Uh, but they certainly filter, and so you'll get a meeting with a partner if you do well in the associate meeting. You should be aware that they are also gathering information about the market, and they could very well be doing an industry landscape. And so you're basically providing free consulting to them. So I wouldn't talk with them at all until you're raising, because why should you be providing free consulting? Um, and I would filter for exactly what their, the purpose of the call is. Now, they may or may not be fully transparent with you, and you should assume that they may, they're almost certainly not gonna invest in you, because that's the math of the industry, and they might invest in a competitor. So I would just keep that in mind as well, that when you speak, the more people you speak with, the more information leakage there is. I'm generally not worried about information leakage, because only competent people can clone your idea, and the competent people tend to be busy with their babies that they think are beautiful, and they think your baby is ugly, so it's not a significant risk, but still, you may be sensitive about overly publicizing certain aspects of your model. Great stuff. Thanks. I'll just add one more thing that came to mind, had a chance to gather my thoughts. Um, make sure, and this might be sort of obvious, I think, to a lot of people, but really make sure that your, that your investor buys into your vision. Not that they think it's a possibly good working model, but like they believe in you and they believe in the vision because, you know, obviously we're looking at a variety of companies, we're only expecting so many to move on, and at the end of the day, this is your baby, if to extend the analogy, and when, when shit hits the fan, like, you know, at the end of the day, you want them to really make sure that they're behind you and that they're giving you advice and giving you mind share as well as time. So keep that. I mean, that, that seems obvious, but really make sure, like, we've looked at a bunch of places where, or a bunch of companies, rather, where we've suggested things and the founders were really adamant about not going that way, and that was fine. We didn't end up establishing a relationship, but at least we understood that sort of respect for what their vision was and how we viewed them. Other questions? So I think we have time to do a quick review of the deck. Why don't we turn off the recording? <coughs>